Welcome everybody, I'm Charlotte. I'm one of the area managers at um, Culture Bridge Northeast. So welcome to Create Ed. This is um, one of the first of the three sessions focusing on dance that we're gonna be delivering in June. So you're very welcome. Really pleased that you're here today. We are expecting a few more people, so hopefully they'll pop into the screen uh, pretty soon. Um, for those of you who don't know um, about Culture Bridge Northeast, we are Art Council England's bridge organisation for the Northeast, and our mission is to connect the cultural sectors with the education sector, just so that children and young people have access to really rich cultural education. So that's about us. I'd now like to introduce and hand over to our facilitators for today. We've got Rob Anderson, uh, and Rob is our industry specialist today. He's a dancer, choreographer, and he's been dancing for over 15 years uh, and teaches and performs internationally. So we're really lucky to have him here with us today. And as always, we have Jean Hale. She's our creative classrooms producer. And Jean is an independent consultant. She works within schools and in the cultural sector. And Jean, your background is in senior management, isn't it? In primary schools as a head teacher, and you've always championed the arts all the way through. Very much so. So actually, I'll, I'll just hand over to Rob now, and I hope everybody has a, has a great morning. Hi everybody, I hope you're doing well. Thanks very much for the introduction. Um, so I thought we'd actually start the day before we do a uh, group introduction, because I'd love to get know you and where you're from. Um, I thought we could start with like a little exercise. And this is something I do when I'm uh, sharing lectures with people, or I'm talking or I'm doing dance classes. It's just to kind of switch on the senses um, and, you know, uh, give us a little bit of a energy boost after that morning coffee's kind of wearing off a little bit so <clears throat> it's dead easy you don't have to get up and move around you can do it from your chair what I want you to do is is place your hands on the side of your ribs and what we're going to do is we're going to take five deep breaths in we're going to inhale through the nose and out through the mouth but I'd like you to focus on breathing into your hands where you feel your hands so here's the first one so we're going to breathe in through the nose and out through the mouth and again, nice and deep. And then change the position of your hands on your chest somewhere. And again, for number four, different position. And the last one wants the different position again. And what we're going to do is we're going to use like where three main fingers to kind of massage the face. So I want you to imagine you can just copy along with me. I want you to imagine that you're not massaging the skin or the muscles. You're kind of trying to feel the bones of your face. So you can just follow along with me. So I'm going to start up here in the middle of my eyebrow and I'm going to start kind of using my fingers like a keyboard. So I'm going to start pressing in. I'm going to start walking around the outside of my eyebrows, really following that um, bone structure around the eye socket. And I'm going to come round the outside and follow that bone structure again underneath. Really feeling that, which finds me on my nose. So I can feel down the nose and come down the outside and across the top of the lip. And you should be able to feel the teeth underneath the lip. And when I come round the outside of the mouth to the bottom teeth, you're really pushing in. It's almost like you're massaging your bones, really. That's going to bring us down to the jaw and the chin, and we can come up the jawbone. So we're gonna come up the side, really pushing in there. And you'll start to get the like a meaty bit, which is your kind of jawbone. So we can start to give that a bit of a circle, really get in there. We'll highlight this muscle a little bit later on. We hold a lot of tension here. It's a hard working muscle. And once you've had enough of that, you can work on the ears. We're gonna pull the ears up, give them a bit of a stretch, and then pull the lobes down, and the stretch down. Sorry if you've got earrings in. And then pull them back as well. And then what we're going to do is we kind of make fingers like Spock and just give the ears a rub on the sides there. And then we've got big face and small face. I'm going to make a really big face. Sorry, you don't worry if it looks a bit silly. Uh, just uh, So we're going to stick the tongue out. And then we're going to make a really tiny face. And then a really big face. And then a tiny face. Hello, if you're just joining. And then the last thing, we're going to make like a horse, you know, we're going to make it really big. So deep breath in. And again, but add a bit of sound. Okay. 
So hopefully after that, you maybe feel a bit tingly in the face. Uh, maybe you feel a bit more aware of your peripheral vision and the space around you. Maybe your ears are tingling a little bit. Um, it's a short movement exercise just to switch on the senses. Um, it's just something I do to switch on. If I, if I feel like I've got Zoom fatigue and I'm switching off, I'll just give myself a bit of a massage. So as Charlotte said, my name is Rob Anderson. I'm a, a freelance dance artist and choreographer. And it's quite difficult to explain what that, what that is. And I'm going to get into it, but I thought it'd be much more convenient if I show you what it looks like. So um, in the dance world, you have things called show reels, which are pretty much like uh, digital CDs. So I thought I'd show you uh, what that looks like. So I'm just going to pop in a screen share here. <laughs> So that's a little bit of what I do um, to give a background. And I know that a few more people are joining. I think Alice has joined in. So I think this would be a good opportunity to, before I sort of get into the story of how I danced and what being a freelance dancer looks like, um, I thought we could introduce ourselves. So I just want to know kind of who you are, what school you're from, and also what kind of experience you've got in facilitating movement and dance in your school so that we all have an understanding of where we're coming from. And if you don't have experience in that, that's completely okay. So we could just go around the room. I don't know if uh, Beverly you'd like to start, perhaps. Hello, hi. Um, I'm. I've got many hats. I'm a school governor at Springwell Village Primary School. So I'm interested from that angle. Um, I do some freelance. Well, well, I do freelance work in the arts generally. Um, I'm also on the board of directors of a very small dance company. So I'm interested from that angle. My degree and background is in dance and movement. So I'm interested on a personal point of view. Nice. So I'm getting my money's worth this morning. <laughs> um, Alison, would you like to go next? I'm an early years teacher in a, in a primary school. Um, and I'm currently teaching a reception class part-time. Um, I've really come along because I'm responsible for delivering the, the PE curriculum to um, to my class and um, we've just done an element on dance but it's something I'd like to develop. Nice, great to meet you. Um, Nicola, do you want to say hello? Hi, yes, um, I haven't got my camera on because I'm in the classroom at the moment so um, just to let you know I'm at Dunn Street Primary School in Jarrow um, I'm PE coordinator. Uh, we have just recently changed from the Val Saban scheme of work to PE Hub, um, but I'm really interested in um, encouraging people to do independent lessons and lessons that are inspired by different things. We've just finished a whole school challenge. We did the Jerusalem dance challenge and had a fabulous time doing that. So we're just looking for some inspiration um, for a subject that certain people find difficult to teach some inspiration would be fab. Good to have you. Um, Carly? Hello, I'm Carly. I'm a primary teacher, well, first school teacher at Rockcliffe First School in Whitley Bay. Um, I am the PE lead, which I was given that role um, with quite a little bit of experience. Um, so it's really just 
to broaden my knowledge on the subject so then I can share that with other members of staff in school. At the moment, I do teach dance as part of my year three and year four curriculum. However, it's just to get some more ideas and confidence. I think confidence is the main thing for me. Nice. Okay. A lot of common themes popping up here. So thanks for sharing. Um, Amy? Hello. Um, yeah, so I'm an NQT at South Gosford First School in Newcastle. Um, and dance is it's always something that I've done. I've did it when I was younger. Um, and I'm really passionate about kind of introducing physical activity into all aspects. Um, of the curriculum. At the moment I'm supporting a Dance City project in school which is connected to our arts award and connected like our school motto about like no outsiders and, and coming together and it's yep. one um, and potentially next year um, as an RQT I'll be moving on to put, potentially being the PE coordinator so um, again like coming on here to kind of get some ideas to, to listen and, and, and to share um, and thoughts and things like that. Nice well thank you for, for all sharing it's great to know your backgrounds and um, I think it's just important because there's a lot of common themes there that this session is very much on the, the why, why we dance, why it's important, why it's, why it's vital, especially in a modern society. And then the next session next week is very much on the how. So I'll start getting into the, the little details of um, uh, facilitating movement sessions after that. So thank you for introducing yourselves. I'd like to start by giving a kind of brief overview of how I got into dance because what I showed you there with the show reel was very Hollywood. It's very the end product. It's lights and it's on stage and all that stuff. That only kind of represents a very small percentage of what I do. So I started dancing when I was 15. Uh, I grew up in a council estate called Pasper Village, right next to the Redshift Bridge, which is being demolished now. And uh, probably for better, <laughs> not for worse. And when I was younger, I was always interested in, in something physical. Uh, anything fast and dangerous enough to hurt myself. So skating, I run, used to run for the Harriers, used to do martial arts. Um, honestly, I had a new hobby every every month, really. And when I started to get to teenage years, I didn't have an outlet and I had all this energy. And this might be something you can relate to, but uh, I was that kind of manifested in a lot of antisocial uh, tendencies, not necessarily bullying or aggression, but a lot of anger, a lot of depression, a lot of sadness. And... Um, Actually, when I became 15, I started to become interested in girls. So um, uh, we used to go to an under 18s nightclub at a club called Baja on the quayside. It's getting renovated at the moment. Um, and uh, basically, uh, one night before we went, we, me and my friend we had seen a film called Hitch starring Will Smith. And he does some like really basic dance moves in there. And we thought it'd be a great idea if we learned how to dance, we'd be more successful with, with ladies and such. So um, we had a quick Google and we found dance lessons at Dance City. And we noticed there was a street dance lesson. We're like, hey, we'll learn a routine and, you know, we'll, we'll be great. So my first lesson, saved up, didn't have a lot of money. It was a lot to ask my mom for like a four or five pound dance lesson. Went there. Uh, my friend didn't turn up. I walked into the dance class. There was 10 other girls there, super intimidating, looking at me like, you're in the wrong place, mate. And halfway through the lesson, I ripped my jeans because I was wearing jeans because I didn't know what to wear from the crotch all the way down to the knee um, in my first lesson. Now, despite that disastrous start, I had a wonderful experience. I absolutely loved it. And I didn't know why, but I knew I had to go back. So after about four or five weeks, I was picking up the, the b-boy and all the breakdance moves much easier. So the teacher went, hey, there's a breaking class on a Thursday. You should go to that. So I patiently waited till the next week. And uh, I walked into the lesson and I instantly knew at the age of 15, that was what I was going to do for the rest of my life. It was just something in the air. And that was it. I was hooked. I was greeted by this man called Lee, super cool guy, really muscly, strong. He had loads of tattoos. He was super cool. I walked into this room. There was interesting music playing. Um, there was people from all different backgrounds, all different ages, sweating, having fun, smiling, working together. And I was in an atmosphere where I wasn't judged on how I looked, how much money I had, how cool I was, which is a world away from schools. I was judged on my skill and ability. And I was okay with that. Like, this is your side of the room. You're a beginner and you can work your way to this side of the room if you get better. So skip on a few years. I studied A-level dance in Newcastle College. I went on to get my degree at the Northern School of Contemporary Dance, which is a conservatoire in the UK. And I've been working as a freelance dancer and a choreographer um, for the past sort of 11 years, really. We're in all over across Europe and the UK. I work in lots of different theatre projects. I work in indoor and outdoor theatre, site-specific work. I do theatre for children. I do uh, educational work, whether it's teaching technique or introduction into dance. 
And over the past few years, I've started making my own work and I'm running my own project called Play in Motion, which is what a lot of the research you're going to hear today is based on. Uh, that was until COVID hit and then everything kind of stopped and we're building back up now. So one thing that kind of floats around or one thing that I encountered very early in my journey in the dance was uh, I think my mother and dad wanted me, wanted me to get a, a real job. Uh, and there's this sort of stigma around the arts that what I do isn't a real job. And that's kind of where I'd really like to start a day and show you what um, my job kind of looks like. Um, so if I just pop over, I'll go to screen share here. I, I think you can all see that. So we've got an image of me here doing a doing a dance move. And um, this is something that's going on. It's part of a project I've got going on at the moment. And it's an image from my website that I'm building. So we can see that I'm a dancer. And this is very much the, the iceberg effect that happens with the, with the art. We see the finished product, which is 10% of the iceberg above the surface. And there's the other 90% below. So here's a few things that I kind of do as part of my job that you don't see behind the image. So I had to make that movement. I'm a choreographer. I design dance. I build dance on other people. I teach dance. I construct dance. It also means I'm a teacher as well. So I teach many different year groups, beginners, advanced, etc. You know, just because you're a good dancer doesn't mean you're a good teacher. I'm sure you can all <laughs> relate to that in some way or another. Uh, when it comes to photography, I'm also a photographer. Now, not in a traditional sense. I don't work with a camera, but I have to know how movement works for a camera, which is completely different to being on stage or teaching, etc. And I have to have a basic understanding of light and angles, etc. I'm also a videographer, so I make dance for film, which again is completely different. It requires a totally different understanding and some movement just doesn't work. That also gets me into editing. So not only do I have to edit movement, I also have to edit digital content, etc. Whether that's photos, videos, or anything else that involves promoting myself. I'm also a researcher. So for example, my product, uh, my project at the moment, Play in Motion, is all about creative um, movement and movement education. So that requires has quite a lot of work behind the scenes and quite a lot of different research methodologies. That also leads me into, I'm an accountant. Uh, I have to do my taxes. I'm self-employed and nobody really teaches you how to do that. I got one session, I think, when I was doing my degree and you kind of have to um, build the wings on the way down. I'm also a manager. Nobody's getting a job for me. Nobody's getting me out of bed in the morning. Nobody's telling me where to go. I have to do all of that myself. Um, and it requires a lot of work. I'm also a rehearsal director. So companies might ask me to go in and clean movement, which is sharpening up, tidying it, making it look better, making it look clean. Also watching work and giving opinions. And the last thing that I could fit on the screen was a personal trainer. So depending on what job I'm doing, uh, so for example, uh, before the lockdown, I was doing a show with Gary Clark company called Wasteland, which is all about the, uh, the illegal acid house raves in the 90s. So that was very much about jumping. So I had to make sure I was doing a lot of jumping and plyometric training. Um, I'm about to start a contract which has got a lot more breakdancing in it, so it requires a lot of different uh, training. I'm constantly learning. You can kind of see that even though I'm a dancer, I'm wearing many hats, spinning many plates, and dance has been the vessel that has allowed me to educate myself on all of these different elements as we go through. And I think that's something we don't really see within the arts. So this is what I kind of like to cover today as we go through. So we've got how and why humans move. This is really, really important to me. This is the this is the thing that I feel like we miss a lot, not just in dance, but in all movement health, why we move as humans and why we're engineered to move the way that we do. We've got an anatomy crash course now. We're not going to be going into the names of muscles and bones. It's not a science lesson. My objective with that is to show you the layers of the body and how it's connected through movement and why movement is so powerful. And then we've got the negative effects of um, a modern lifestyle on the body and movement. This is the bit where I'm going to try and scare you a little bit, <laughs> um, but it's okay. There's a cure and that is movement and movement is medicine. So um, we'll get to that as we go through. This session is very much a conversation. So between each section, please feel free to ask questions. Or if you want to keep them to the end, we can chat about it at the end. Um, and if I don't have an answer for you, I'll try and get it for the next session. Yeah, I'm not going to blag and pretend I know something when I don't. I'd rather be transparent. There's a couple of themes to keep in mind as we go through today. Um, and you're probably like, why has he got AT on the screen? <laughs> so I think dance can be very intimidating. And this is the first theme. There's been so many times when I go into work with professionals, individuals, um, and I say, hey, everybody, my name's Rob and I'm a dancer. And we're going to do some dance today and the eyes glaze over the chest comes up everyone starts looking around as if to say like oh my god i don't want to dance so today when i say dance i'm going to switch dance for movement because you might not believe this or you might not agree with me but you are all experts at movement you really are all of the intricate details that you use with your hands when you're writing or typing the fact that you've used nearly every muscle in your body to put your clothes on today 
um, the fact that you've walked, <laughs> you know, uh, or you, uh, you know, the ability to move your arms in conjunction with your hips. These are complex movement patterns that take years to learn. And you are experts at moving, even making a cup of tea. That's a really complex movement pattern. So swap movement for that, swap dance for movement. Next thing I was going to say is that even though you're mainly primary school educators, you're working with young people, I will be speaking mainly about movement uh, across generations. And that's mainly a logistical thing because a lot of the evidence that we have to support why movement is important is based on adults. And that's actually really valuable for primary school educators because we notice a lot of bad movement habits in adults. And it begins very early on. So if we can find out what's going wrong with adults, we can be introduce positive movement habits early on. And the last sort of theme for today is basically to say like my my objective is to encourage you all to move more. So if I can inspire you to move more in your life, to take that class you wanted to take, to go out for more walks, maybe try something spontaneous like a dance class, I'll be super happy. And hopefully it, it pumps you up for the next session next week uh, where we'll be doing a bit more movement. So I hope that's all clear. Uh, and we've got a little bit of an activity here so i might need charlotte to help me out i'm gonna break into breakout rooms so we can have a little bit of a conversation before we start going into the, the meat of the presentation and what i'd like you to consider is your thoughts feelings or emotions when it comes to movement you know like i said i work with adults a lot and there can be a lot of tension and apprehension about movement um but i just want to kind of know what you know and we could discuss it in groups Hey everybody, welcome back. Um, I had some great, some great perspectives there. I don't know if anyone, we've got like a couple of minutes if anyone wants to share anything that really popped out. It's okay. We, we were talking um, about how just translating dance to movement kind of really grounds it and and makes it feel more accessible. And, and often people think about dance maybe as, as something that's a specialism. I think the arts suffer from this quite a lot that you have to have a, a skill set to be able to do it so I think if we just address it as movement with young people it makes it more accessible adding into that I was thinking about the, the calling it movement removes barrier of the language of dance which has its place and it's wonderful I totally agree yep um Nicola Carla Carly I don't know if you want to chip in anything you don't have to I don't know if anything popped out there Yes, I was talking with um, with Jean and Beverly, and we were just saying exactly that. And the power of positive role models as well, I think, is really important um, in getting across that barrier. It, sometimes it's not a language barrier; it's just a, a concept of what what they're going to do when it's not kicking a football. It's something totally different to that. Um, and finding those positive role models, I think, is really really helpful. I was saying we 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 did a lot with JJ Chalmers when he was on Strictly, watching him and following him and seeing him as somebody that, gosh, if he can do it, anybody can do it. And if you can enjoy it at the same time, that's even more fabulous. Yeah, totally agree. So, yeah, um, yeah, this is a common theme that's popped up and kind of in a sentence the way that i see it is yeah every like i was saying everyone's a movement specialist but dance is just movement with style that's all it is do you know what i mean i think it's i think it's mysticized a lot and people who teach dance are seen as kind of like gurus or experts but everybody moves everybody moves some people are just better at it than others and that's okay but everyone has the potential to move beautifully so um that leads us quite nicely into where we're going so why we move why we move the way that we do why we're built to move and this is something that uh, has sort of consumed my research over the past few years. So I'm going to kind of give you a brief uh, breakdown. We'll pop back in the screen share here. So you'll see here I've got a timeline that says a million years. Now, human beings as we know them as homo sapiens are roughly about a million years old. You can give or take a few thousand years, but a million years is a nice flat number that gives us a time frame to work with. Now, for 990,000 of those years, or 99%, we were nomadic hunters and gatherers, okay? So we were moving around, not settling. Uh, we were, you can imagine the movement that comes with that. We were running, we were climbing, we were crawling, we were squatting, throwing, tearing, ripping, swimming. Our movement was dynamic and reactive to the environment that we were in. And the environment was always changing. So we evolved to move like that. That's why, that's why we have uh, free limbs and a mobile spine and all of this movement. And we know that we moved like that because there's still pockets of society that move this way now. This next image is a, is a hunter-gatherer tribe from Tanzania. And 
It's interesting, there was an experiment done where the uh, scientists strapped uh, pedometers to their ankles and they were taking upwards of 30,000 steps a day just hunting. They were constantly moving around. So we know that humans moved like that. So like I said, for about 990,000 years. And then about 10,000 years ago, give or take a few years, we discovered agriculture. So that meant that in terms of movement, we didn't have to travel around so much. We could grow our own food now. And you can imagine that limited the scope of movement. So you might have a role in society now. You might be planting or you might be uh, uh, caught, uh, herding cattle or you might be building houses to, to facilitate workers, etc. So our scope of movement shrinks a little bit as we become more um built as a society that means that we can build hamlets and towns and even cities and then about 200 years ago we became industrialized as a society so i think in this image here it might not be super clear on your screen but it, i think it's a it's a shoe processing plant so they're putting leather on shoes so you might imagine you might have a job there and for 20 30 40 50 years you might be doing one job you might just be putting leather on a shoe day in day out and then about 40 to 60 years ago as a society we became digitalized. And I don't need to tell you this. I'm sure that most of us have experienced a day where we can do all our jobs with just these, uh, which is, I don't know if that's good or bad. I'm not here to comment on that. I'm just here to comment on it in terms of movement. So a million years is really, really difficult to um, picture because we're not built to deal with these numbers. So here's a number that's much more easier to process. So if we think about things in terms of a day from midnight until 11.40, we were nomadic hunters and gatherers. And then for about 19 minutes and 40 seconds, we were farmers. And then just up until midnight, one second beforehand, we were industrialized. And then for one second, we were digitalized. So in other words, in about 20 minutes out of a whole day, we've went from this multi-dimensional, uh, multi-functional human movement that we've evolved to do into thumb people <laughs> so our scope of movement has shrunk all the way down and the danger there is is that our evolution hasn't changed our society has evolved thousands of times faster than our bodies have so we can still move the way that we were designed to move but society kind of stops that um, so we have to be more delicate and sensitive to the fact that we are built to move so i want to start to get hopefully that gives you a bit of context as to as to why we move it's really, really important. And I want to kind of get in now to the anatomy crash course. And like I said, it's not a science lesson. I'm going to give you my perspective of anatomy as a dancer and how I learned anatomy. And the objective here is to show you how we are connected. It's not just it's not just individual systems. It's one big system. So we want to start on the outside. So actually, if you if you stick your fingers out as far as you can go, uh, just give your fingers a wiggle. And I want you to reach all the way to the ceiling, all the way up really stretch as far as you can go and then you're going to stretch down to the side so all the way to the side of the room and then keep your arms outstretched but just keep reaching in all different directions as far as you can go and what you'll find is is that you've almost got this like invisible hamster wheel around you as far as you can reach just outside your outside your uh outside your touch and you can let that go so that kind of invisible hamster ball in dance is what's known as the kinesphere and this was a term that was popularized by rudolf Laban. Um, who is a practitioner, who, a really famous choreographer. He's got a, there's a school that he established in London called the Laban School of Movement and Arts. And the kinesphere, the way that I like to describe it, is kind of like your comfort zone or your bubble zone. And we've all experienced it when we've been too close to somebody and our bubble zones kind of like mix. And you're like, oh, you're in my personal space. And what's interesting about this is that over the past two years with COVID, I feel like our um, comfort zones have got bigger. In, 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 in the sense that we've been told to stay away from people for that physical, that first layer of contact is actually more difficult than it used to be. So then if we go a layer deeper, we get to the skin and the skin is, is absolutely fantastic. The way I like to think about it is this suit, this suit of armor that connects us to the outside world. Uh, you know, it allows our brain to experience the world around us and it serves many functions. Now you'll notice on the on the screen here, I've got some little flash facts that you can take away. So if you need to copy them and, and take them for your students, if you want to share things, please go for it. And for this uh, entire presentation, there's a handout that I don't know if you've received yet, but it's got all of the um, information that I've built my research on and little, little digestible chunks if you, if you want to uh, get stuck into that. So our skin serves a couple of main functions, mainly protection, regulation and sensation but it also does loads of other wonderful things. It's waterproof, it's heat proof, it protects you from UV, 
It exudes uh, antibacterial substances to stop you from getting infected. And it's flexible in terms of movement. It allows us to move. It's absolutely brilliant. You know, when you've got your thickest skin on your feet and your thinnest skin is on your eyelids there. And this is where the, the ki uh, kids love this when I'm teaching students, but I always tell them to get the hoover out because about half the dust in your house is you because you get a new set of skin every 28 days. So if you haven't hoovered this week, maybe get your hoover out. <laughs> um, if we go a layer deeper, we get down to the muscles. Now, in modern society, there's a lot of emphasis put on the muscles. You know, we're in the gym, we're working out, etc. Big muscles, big and strong. But they only play uh, a big role, but only a certain role in what we do. And that's mainly locomotion. They get us around. We've got two different types of muscles, really. We've got um, voluntary and involuntary muscles. Now, luckily, the involuntary muscles are kind of like your cardiovascular system, your heart, your lungs, things like that. You don't have to worry about it because I forget my keys, so I'm glad I don't have to forget worry about my heart beating. One of my favorite facts here is the fact that it takes 17 muscles to smile, but 43 to frown. So it's literally harder to be miserable, which is uh, always useful when, I'm, when I tell kids we're going to do push-ups or something and they, they, they twist their face and they don't like to do it. And we were massaging uh, the mass of the muscle earlier, which uh, it can actually exude 200 pounds of biting force in your jaw. And uh, the largest muscle is your gluteus maximus. And some would say that there's a correlation between the strength of this and the size of this, but I'll, I'll leave that to you to, to have a go at. So we've got kinesphere, skin, muscles, and then underneath that, we've got the bones, the skeleton. And that's very much the uh, scaffolding that everything sits on and wraps around. And yes, it plays lots of amazing roles like protects our vital organs, produces blood, etc. But one of the things that it does in terms of movement is act as a shock absorption system. So if we understand how to correctly align ourselves, we can take the shock out of things like walking, dancing, running, etc. And I'll get into that later on. You've noticed at the bottom there, I highlighted that there's 54 bones in the hands, but more importantly, there's 26 bones in the feet. And that's going to come in really important later on. Now, why on earth am I going on about all these different layers and how are they connected? You obviously know what bones are, you know what muscles are, etc. You're familiar with your skin, you see it every day. Well, wrapped around, in between, throughout, is something that we know as connective tissue or what's also known as fascia. Now, I'm not going to try and give you a masterclass on fascia because it is a universe of information and it's constantly being researched and I could not do it justice in five minutes, but I'm gonna try. <laughs> so um, fascia is really fascinating when it comes to dance. And you can see the images on the left-hand side of the screen here. It kind of looks like little cobwebs. So if you hold your forearm out in front of you and you pinch your skin and then lift your skin up, that's what's happening in the image underneath. You have these little cobwebs of fascia all around your body. And if you removed your skin, your bones, your skeleton, and just had the fascia, it would resemble what your body looks like in space. And the fascia is vital for movement. And I'm going to show you why. So I'm going to show you a little video. This is by a woman called Dana Sterling, who deals with structural integration and manipulation of the fascia. That's what kind of happens when you go to physiotherapy. And she's going to show you a really great example of how um, damaging the body, poor posture, um, any sort of damage to the muscle, bones, and connective tissue can really debilitate movement. So let's have a quick look here. And notice the cobwebs, right? They're doing well, right? So he can lift his arms, he can move, he can go hike, um, he can go play tennis, he can do it, he can tie his shoes, no pain, okay? No problem. I'm about to change that. So I'm gonna give Cody a myofascial restriction at his right rib cage and armpit. And if you can already see, he's already having to adapt a little bit against this. Good. So now, Cody, go ahead and try to lift both arms up for me. And we're gonna just, woo, good. Okay, so can you see that his range of motion is restricted, restricted right now? Really try to lift them up higher, Cody. Okay, now drop them back down because, ow, that's not fun. Now, this makes sense, right? You can imagine how this is going to create this restriction. Did you notice what happened at his left shoulder over here? Uh-huh, yeah? So go ahead, lift both of them again. A fascial restriction here is causing some serious range of motion issues over here. Now let's drop that down, and I'm going to give him a fascial release and fix him up, and now, woohoo, yeah. Did you notice him kind of move his neck? That can, is not comfortable in the neck either. Just going to give you a brief example, a client that came to see us, fully torn rotator cuff. The surgeon said, sorry, can't repair it, fully torn. She now has that full range of motion and no more pain. 
because we actually helped her modify her fascial restriction and she changed certain habits to not recreate it. So it's actually incredibly adaptive. Okay, your body is incredibly adaptive. It does not rely on just one small little muscle and there are even four little rotator cuff muscles if you create balance elsewhere. So hopefully that gives, uh, that makes a little bit of sense. Okay, brilliant. So that's a practical example. Obviously the, the guy's got one of those morph suits on and we kind of see like this cobwebby design. And if you've done any, you've had an injury before or you sit all day and you get a really sore back and that might go into your neck or et cetera, we can see how the body's interconnected. Why am I going on about the fascia? Why is it important? Well, this is my mic drop moment in the presentation. So one of the ways in which we keep fascia healthy is movement and not necessarily going to the gym and lifting weights like this sort of two-dimensional movement where it's focused on the muscles. What you find is, is that what well, research is showing that multi-directional, bouncy, versatile movement where those fascia, like these spider webs, are getting stretched and twisted in all different ways, stimulates the health of the fascia. And because the fascia is connected to your bones, your organs, your brain, your skin, your muscles, by stimulating the health of the fascia, we stimulate the health of the rest of the body. So movement is practically feeding your body nutrition. Um, that's a very rough cliff notes of what fascia is and why movement is important. There's a massive uh, link on the handout with this presentation, but in short, movement is really good for your body. And that's why. <laughs> so you're much better off doing a dance class or a yoga class or something like that if you want to focus on fascial health. I'm going to move on here and I want to start to talk about the negative effects of a modern life. Now, if you're anything like me, you love shoes. Okay. Now I've probably got far too many shoes than I actually need. Um, and if you do any sort of activity, there's a kind of a shoe to go with it. There's shoes for powerlifting, shoes for running, shoes for cycling, um, all different types. And shoes are fantastic. They play a vital role in society, mainly because we live in concrete jungles and you can't walk around barefoot. However, they've significantly changed how we move as humans. If you look at the shape of the foot, this is the foot on the side, obviously big toe at the top, heel at the bottom, into the, into the ankle. It looks very, very similar to the shape of the spine. If you look at the side view, and we can see how the big toe kind of looks like the cervical spine and metatarsals begin to look like the thoracic spine all the way down to the heel bone, the sacral and et cetera. Now that's not by an accident. You remember I said earlier that the skeleton acts as a shock absorption system. Well, when we articulate to the feet, that shock absorption goes through the spine and comes out to the top of the head. So we can kind of ripple as we walk. Now, when we used to walk barefoot, going back to that hunter nomadic gatherer time, we would take shorter steps. So if this was the floor, we would strike the floor with the middle of our foot, rolling through the toes and pushing into the next step, which would allow us to move for longer, use less energy, and use that shock absorption through the spine. However, with the invention of modern day shoes, which have a thick sole, we could take longer steps, which meant that we could hit the floor with our heel as we're taking longer steps. Now that might not seem like much, but there has been research done in 2014 that show, that compared barefoot walking to shoe walking. And even in the knees alone, the group that wore shoes had a 12% increase of pressure in the knees. That's not factoring in hips, spine, ankles, that's just the knees. Now 12% might not seem like much, but 12% year in, year out, year in, year out is compounded and that's when we start to get injury. Now, long story short, I'm not saying shoes are bad. Don't go home and throw your heels in the bin. <clears throat> but what I'm saying is any excuse to get your feet out, uh, especially with students, get them, get them either barefoot or in socks, get them moving around, uh, research things like feet massage, things like that. It has a huge connection all the way through the spine. So if we can encourage young people to be comfortable barefoot or walking around the classroom in feet, it's really really great for the effects of posture and movement and also a lot of adults are kind of freaked out by feet because they're always hidden they're, they're cramped into shoes so we should be encouraging people to walk around um, barefoot or in socks so that's something for the bottom now i'm sure we're all from what i can see we're all sat in chairs so let's go up a level the next thing i want to talk about is chairs um now it's my opinion uh, the opinion of many other people in uh, medical fields who are far more intelligent than me that chairs are pure poison for human beings. Um, and the reason for that is, is that we don't need back support when we're standing. So why would we need it when we're sitting? 
Um, now, obviously, again, this is a societal thing. Most of our jobs require us to sit and look at screens all day. However, there's a certain way that we can utilize chairs rather than uh, them utilizing us. So this might look familiar if you're a teacher uh, or you've got young ones in the house. Uh, this might look familiar if you've got a deadline. It's really not a positive thing to see at all. But this is sort of a diagram of how we should sit. So one thing that I noticed, especially when I was growing up, I was never taught how to sit. I was never taught how to use a chair. And there's a really quick way that we can do that. And even when I go in to teach a uh, degree level and dancers, they don't know how to sit. And I'm like, you're a dancer and you don't know how to sit. So we're going to fix that really quickly. So wherever you're sitting now, I want you to plant your feet into the ground so that you uh, imagine your knees and ankles are at a 90 degree angle. So we can feel our feet in the ground. If you can't get your feet flat on the ground, they're like swinging underneath or going too far out. The chair's too tall or too short. What you're going to do is you can take your hands, put one hand under one butt cheek, one hand under the other, and you should be able to feel little bony bits, your sit bones. These are called the ischial tuberosities. And if you tuck your pelvis, you'll start to curve back. And if you tilt your pelvis, you'll start to arch forward. And if you just do that a few times, you want to try and find that middle ground where you're perched on the sit bones and they're elevating, keeping you up. Then you can remove your hands and you can have that contact with the ischial tuberosities on your seat. And that allows the spine and the head to sit on top of the hip, hips and be supported by the feet. Now, if I asked you to sit like this for the rest of the presentation, your back's going to get sore and you're going to go like this. And that's because you don't really sit like that unless you've got really good posture. But why is that important? Well, poor posture, especially for young students, limits the flow of oxygen. And the, that limited flow of oxygen limits the uh, concentration. And if we're asking students to concentrate for five, six, seven hours, that's not really good. Um, and they start to get lazy and they start to go bad posture, et cetera. Also, poor sitting posture shortens the fascia and the muscles on the front of the body. It stretches the muscles and the fascia on the back of the body and it weakens it. So when you go to do an exercise and you, oh, I pull my back, that's one of the reasons where it comes from because we're not sitting properly. So if you've ever jarred your back, that's not good. So more time bare feet, more time sitting properly. And the golden rule there is, is that if you're sitting correctly and your back starts to ache, that's when you need to get up, stretch, move around, sit back down because your body's telling you, you've sat too much now. You need to move around a little bit. Yeah. So let's go up a level further and we'll deal with something up here now, mobile phones or screens or tablets or anything like that. And this is becoming more and more important for young people. So this might look familiar. This definitely looks familiar. My cousin is like this all the time. It's really not positive. Uh, you know, you can look at, you can imagine if you x-ray these people, you can imagine what their spines look like right now. So mobile phones and everything like that. Now, again, I'm not saying chuck your mobile phones or your tablets out. They're fantastic. They serve so many functions, but again, it's understanding how we use it. So there's loads of different studies showing why they're bad for us, they're bad for our eyes and things like that. On, during my research, I found a, a piece of information that's particularly important for education. Now, in 2017, there was a study done that compared people who had excessive screen phone, uh, screen time. Uh, excessive screen time consists of four hours of more a day, which a lot of us over lockdown, we're easily getting that because we're sat on screens all the time. Now, people who were using screens and didn't know how to sit or had poor posture, they had something called a lower PEF. Now, that's a uh, peak respiratory flow, <laughs> PEF, peak respiratory flow. What that basically means is they had shallow breathing. They had less oxygen going in, less carbon dioxide going out. They weren't able to focus more. And I'm sure you've maybe noticed it, that if you've been on a phone for an extended period of time and someone asks you to do something, there's a delay in being able to switch from your phone to what you need to do. I definitely see this with young people that I work with. It's not about not using these devices, but it's about using them correctly, bringing the devices up to us rather than coming down to the devices and also limiting the time. Know when you've had enough, take a little break, get up and walk around. Because again, you know, it's getting to the point now where physiotherapists are treating things called text neck because people's necks are like this all the time. It's stretching the body and damaging the back of the neck. So all of this information isn't to scare you. It's not to freak you out. It's not to say that this is wrong or this is right. It's mainly just to say that we need to be careful about how we use these things. And these are just three examples. There's 
hundreds of things in a modern society that are damaging the way that we move and we just have to be more conscious of it but it's not all doom and gloom it's not all negative there's one way we can fix it and the answer is movement and it's free and it's cheap <laughs> and it's really healthy and i want to just sort of like sort of finish the the conversation today with the benefits of movement um, and it's not just physical we know that there's lots of physical benefits to movement and they come up in the form of things like uh, increased call uh, the they decrease the risk of cardiovascular disease. They decrease the risk of type 2 diabetes, all that sort of stuff. And I'm going to get onto that in just a minute. The thing that a lot of people ask me is, how long should I be moving for? How do I know I'm getting the right amount? You know, how do I fit movement into my busy lifestyle? I, I work 10, 12 hour days and I've got kids and my kids have to study and they have to do great homework. How do I fit it in? So there's a fantastic uh, TED talk by a neuroscientist called Wendy Suzuki. Uh, which I've got this information from, and it's in the handout, and I really encourage you to watch it. It's fantastic. Now, Wendy was doing a lot of work in the lab, and she noticed that she was gaining a lot of weight. She was feeling miserable. She was beginning to hate her job, and she realized that she just needed to start exercising. Long story short. So she started exercising. She started feeling good. She started losing weight, and she went, hey, there's, there's something I can study here. So she made it her mission to figure out how long we should be exercising for and why. And these are kind of the golden rules that uh, exercise is based on. So let's take a look at them. You should be exercising for a minimum of three to four times a week, three to four times a week. And those three to four sessions should be a minimum of 30 minutes a session. And what's really important about that is that these sessions are aero aerobic and cardiovascular based. In other words, getting the heart rate up. And if you make that the bare minimum, we've got 168 hours in your week. And that if the bare, bare minimum to get through that equates to two hours, I would argue, I'm not here to tell you about your life and things like that, but I would argue that if you don't have two hours out of 168 to exercise, there's something wrong. Something needs to be rebalanced. And one of the most important things about Wendy Suzuki's research, because she's a neuroscientist, once we become adults, sort of 25 onwards, our brains degenerate. Okay. And this is, this is something that I really want you to take away today as an adult. Our prefrontal cortex, this bit in the front, and the hippocampus, it kind of sits between the ears. The prefrontal cortex deals with day-to-day -day activities, maths, timing, getting up for bed, getting dressed, etc. The hippocampus deals with memory. And we're noticing in society as we're getting older and we're having more sedentary-based lifestyles that there's a lot of mental degenerative diseases. My grandmother had uh, Alzheimer's and it, it claimed her life. And if anyone knows a relative that's had Alzheimer's, unfortunately, it kind of turns your mind to soup. And there's not a cure but there is a way to prevent it as possible. And it's been proven now that it is exercise. So once we become adults, about 25 onwards, our brain matter shrinks by about 1% every year. We lose 1% of our prefrontal cortex and hippocampus. But Wendy Suzuki's research is showing that people who exercise these bare minimum, they're getting cardiovascular exercise three to four times a week. We can actually grow brain matter by 2% a year. We can grow brain cells. And if it's not by 2% a year, it's at least in, on par with what you're losing. So you're replacing what you're losing. Uh, this isn't going to cure long-term mental degenerative diseases, but it's going to push them back as long as possible. And if that's not a motivation to get out there and get healthy and get exercise and, and set a role model for young people, I don't know what is. So yeah, I'd talk Wendy Suzuki for more information and it's in the handout and I couldn't recommend looking at it enough. But I just want to go on to the sort of benefits of movement. These are the sort of flash facts that you can take away, put them on your fridge, put them on the classroom so that people know why movement is positive and powerful and all that jazz. So I spoke about earlier about movement as medicine. So one of the physical benefits, you're probably familiar with these. These are the ones that get rammed down our throats from uh, the NHS and it's on the TV and we see doctors talking about them. These are the easy ones. Decreased risk of cardiovascular diseases, decreased risk of type 2 diabetes, weight maintenance, reduced risk of cancers, muscular hypertrophy. Um, hypertrophy and atrophy, for those who don't know, atrophy is when you don't use your muscles, they waste away. And hypertrophy is when we use our muscles, they get sore, they get damaged and they grow back stronger. And it's kind of sod's law with this one, <laughs> not sod's law, but it's kind of unfair. It happens on a three to one ratio. So your muscles atrophy three times more than you get hypertrophy. So you have to work three times as hard. I'm really sorry, but that kind of correlates with the working out three to four times a week and also boosts the immune system, which is fantastic, especially when we're dealing with uh, COVID and things like that. Obviously movement isn't the cure to that, 
but it's going to boost your immune system, which is going to help fight off other things like colds and flus and things. But the mental benefits is something that I really want to highlight, especially with the effects of COVID and what I've noticed on young people, especially teenagers, you know, they haven't been able to see their friends, they've been isolated a lot. We've seen a lot of spike in uh, mental health issues over the, over the lockdown period. So there's a range of mental benefits when it comes to movement. Like there's so many to talk about, but I want to highlight one in particular. So a 2014 study compared regular exercises to non-regular exercises. Remember I was talking about switching dance to movement? It's all about movement. Um, and what I found is, is that the people... Uh, both test studies were put under a stress test. They were putting in a, putting an opportunity. Uh, they were put in a situation where they had to do maths at the same time as spotting colours on the wall, while kind of rock and roll movement music was playing. So it was really really stressful. And both groups got stressed. Both groups had hell elevated heart rate. Uh, both groups were kind of you know getting annoyed, etc. But what researchers found is is that the groups that were exercising regularly, following these golden rules, they were able to recover from the stress faster, much faster. In other words they had more mental resilience. I think that's really, really important and really vital because mental stress isn't going away. And actually students are just going to deal with more and more mental stress as they get older. You know, if it's not the SATs, it's the A-levels. If it's not A-levels, it's the degree. If it's not degree, it's work. And it just keeps getting more and more stressful. But if we can build that mental resilience, especially from a young age, we can prepare young people for the rigors of a modern lifestyle, mentally at least anyway. So that's another reason to get out there and get dancing and get moving. And this is kind of like my, the thing that I'd like to sort of leave you with before I kind of open the floor for questions and a little bit of discussion at the end is why I would champion dance above other physical activity. Now, when it comes to choosing a physical activity, my golden rule is do one that you enjoy. Far more benefit doing something where you're doing it with friends or you're having a laugh or you genuinely enjoy doing it because it doesn't feel like exercise. You know, I love dancing, but it's my job. So I actually quite enjoy cycling. I love getting on the bike. I also love rock climbing. There's a fantastic rock climbing wall down uh, near Biker. It's absolutely brilliant. And it doesn't feel like you're exercising because you're having fun. But dance in particular has a lot of um, social benefits and skills that aren't associated with necessarily all physical activity. So I'd like to kind of like rattle through a few. Nonverbal communication, you know, people having to work with their bodies and figure out where people are in space. Quick thinking, if I ask somebody to make 30 seconds of material or make eight positions and you've got 10 seconds to do it, it switches on your brain in a new way. Problem solving, get from one side of the room to the other without your feet leaving the ground, yeah, for example. Decision making, sometimes you have to make tough decisions when you're dancing. What if someone gets injured? <clears throat> what if you, you don't have the skills to do it? Are you gonna stop? No, you just figure out a way to do it. Teamwork, so vital. Adaptability, responsibility, precision, especially within dance. You know, I don't I want your arm here i want it here i've had that many times <laughs> time management creativity focus and confidence building that last one for me uh, the last two focus and confidence building i found those two extremely extremely vital when it comes to dance uh, the amount of young people who i teach a session and they bounce out of the studio because they've they've experienced something really powerful now the last thing i'd like to leave on before we open it up for questions and conversation is that over the lockdown period I, all my work disappeared. I was booked up for 12 months and it all disappeared. <clears throat> and I was faced for the first time in my career since, since supporting myself during my education with kind of getting a, a real job when I was looking at all these adverts. And one thing that I definitely noticed is that all of the adverts I looked at were looking for people with these skills. And I'm not saying that dance is a hobby or dance should be, you know, a career for skill, uh, something for skills and then leave. But definitely all the dancers that I know have these skills and dance is a great way for building well-rounded, responsible, reliable human beings because it deals with these people skills that we associate with successful people. Um, and I think that's the power of dance. I think it builds people who are responsible within society. And that's kind of where I want to kind of leave the day before we, before we have a conversation. So I hope that all of that information has um, inspired you to move more, made you see the value of dance. And I know there's not been a lot on sort of uh, the actual activity, but next week's session is gonna be all on how I structure a workshop, how I put everything together, exercises that I use and why. And then also we're gonna be relating that to my current project, which is Play in Motion, which focuses less on dance technique, which you get a lot of people teaching, which is fine, but more on creative, to creative tools, how we can encourage people to think with their bodies make movement and take ownership of what they create because actually when people have the tools to create movement it becomes a lot more fun 
rather than just exercise. And if anyone has any questions or thoughts or feelings, we've got time now where we can just chat and rap about all of that. I would just like to say just a massive thank you. Just I think there's some really, really interesting um, and brilliant. I think, Rob, you've shared quite a lot. I, I mean, I, I just carry on from what Amy said, really. I think you've shared a lot of kind of real kind of background and, and kind of foundation stuff and knowledge and understanding that I think teachers would find really useful. And I think the way that you've you've kind of related it to, you know, this is how we're living our lives and this is kind of why this type of movement isn't good and this is. And, and I think, again, particularly for young people who are probably becoming more sedentary because of the, the kind of digital world that they live in, movement really is is quite a crucial thing so I think as Amy said there's a lot of really useful stuff there for teachers just to have that kind of depth of understanding about the body and why it's important to move. Thank you very much I mean one of the things that popped up in the first sort of uh, the, the breakout room is that one thing I've experienced through my research is that we associate exercise with a chore. Uh, there's a lot of negative language around it, like working out, uh, you know, smash it, kill it, you know, no pain, no gain. Like, you know, what the, one of the ones is like sweat is pain, leaving the body like, oh, come on, man. We, we're, we're teaching young people that exercise is a chore. When it's not, you're designed to move. You know, it's, if, if it's, it's something that you should enjoy doing. Uh, because you're built to do it. So I think that if we have this information, which is, again, what I've covered today is just a brief, brief amount. I think if we have this solid foundation where we're able to translate that to people of all ages, they understand that, actually, hold on, I'm, I'm built to move here. I don't have to be self-conscious about it. I don't have to worry that I'm not going to fit in. Like, my body is made to move, and I'm going to utilize that. So if anything I've said today piques your interest, I've uh, the handout that's with constructed with this session I know that you're all super busy. You've got really, really busy jobs. So I've um, built it in a way that there's podcasts, short videos, a couple of books that you can order and access. And then if something really interests you, there's a couple of longer lectures there. Um, so there, there's a lot of different formats for you can access in your own time. I absolutely love that, Rob. I mean, personally, it was good to be reminded of stuff that you knew and have just let drift out of your life. Um, and and it is really useful for schools it's very practical and it's health etc what we all know as well that any kind of creativity and for me personally movement is it's it takes it's everything it is who you are so which is what you're saying but the creativity it's like your soul isn't it it's your emotions your soul your brain it's everything but i think the better not the better sell I'm sorry I didn't mean it like that but the more it, into schools is this the physical and health side of it but of course the benefits are like 360 degrees but I get not everybody wants to hear about the other side of it you know and of course the benefit to your concentration in terms of the rest of the curriculum yeah so anyway thank you no no I, I totally i totally agree and you know what a there's a couple of things that you point out there that i didn't pick up on you know um in terms of like posture and sitting correctly where young students are coming into school and they've had the breakfast which they should be encouraged to eat but when we sit in a poor way that's putting more pressure on the digestive system and the digestive system is practically your brain on its on its own. So when we ask when when students come in and they don't sit properly, most of the energy is coming from here down to here, and we don't really want that. So that's that's not very good. But also <clears throat> in terms of um, you know the the structure of the body, our nervous system and our fascial system is connected emotionally, not just physically. And we can see that particularly in teenagers when they when they begin to become self conscious and they begin to sort of get to those um. Uh, social that socially intricate stage of life um, where we become uh, I call it an apologetic posture where the kind of shoulders close in and the head drops a little bit and the hands cross the body and some people don't grow out of that body language we see it in adults today and then that progresses when we start to see like OAPs and they've got really really bad posture really bad posture and that not only affects the physical but it affects the emotional and social as well and you're apologizing with your body, whereas through movement, we can encourage people to be open, powerful, self-confident, stand tall, stand strong. 
And again, that feeds the, the fascial and the, the emotive system and it builds confidence rather than taking it away, which I think is fantastic. And that, and it's, that's the kind of stuff that's used in NLP, isn't it? In yes, neuro-linguistic yeah. programming, you get into your power position, but it is that yeah, yeah, exactly. conversation between the body and the emotions. So yes, that's also excellent for, for everyone, but for young people particularly. Definitely, couldn't agree more. Um, if anyone's got any questions or wants to say anything else, please just chip in. Can I just say that um, I really like the hamster wheel analogy and the fact oh, that right. I have my own hamster wheel. I just find that really fascinating. I am going to share that with others. <laughs> well, it's um, next week. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a couple of different exercises from Play and Motion. Now, these exercises have been developed from... Uh, some of them I've developed myself, some of them I've learned from other choreographic practices. And one of them, uh, Laubin's kind of hemisphere, develops into something called Laubin's Cube, which is a really simple and effective movement choreographic task uh, for young people and people who don't dance. Um, and it, it, it gets really advanced, but the basic stages can be really, you can do them from a chair, you can do them from, from, uh, you can do them from home, you can do them in the kitchen, you can do them in the bathroom. And it's something that I've been utilizing in my online Zoom sessions. So we're definitely going to link that in the next uh, next week. I really enjoyed the um, the stuff you were saying, the neuroscience stuff about the brain and the resilience and all of that. And I was thinking about that that link to the back to the recovery curriculum with schools and building in movement and all of that. I think there's a really strong link there. So I was really interested in that bit. Thank you. That's quite all right. Um, I think uh, on the handout, there's a, a podcast link. If anyone's got Spotify or utilizes Spotify, there's a podcast called the Huberman Lab. Uh, I can't remember his full name, but he, something Huberman. And he is the uh, one of the world's leading specialists in neuroscience at Stanford University in America. And he's doing groundbreaking research, not just on the brain, but on uh, the power of emotions, because we don't actually know what emotions are, what they do. They, we know we feel a certain way, but it's a mystery. And they're researching a lot on the effect of modern society, the effect of pressure and stress, uh, and how emotion can affect the entire system. Uh, and it's a really fantastic podcast, really quite bite-sized, 45-minute chunks if you want to learn more about that, I definitely recommend that podcast for sure. Brilliant. We're going to send out the resource pack um, tomorrow, I think, alongside an evaluation for you to, to fill in. So you'll be getting that tomorrow from Ellen. Has anyone got, else got, anybody got any questions for, for Rob before we, we close for the day? I don't, it's Carly, I don't have any questions. I just wanted to comment and say that it's been really interesting for me, especially thinking about why dance is in the curriculum and why it is so important because I think a lot of teachers that I know in terms of PE don't have the confidence to teach PE and there'll be certain elements that they may just kind of do a little bit of as a ticky box exercise say without really embracing that opportunity and understanding all of the benefits that are behind that and how it impacts on everything in school potentially um, and it's something that I'd really enjoy to share. I actually have a staff meeting. I'm holding a staff meeting on Monday. And again, it's something that I'd really like to share with um, our team at school. So thank you very much for that. Oh, my pleasure. I'm glad it's been beneficial. I mean, I, in terms of delivery, I, I mean, it, it's different. <laughs> I, think a lot of, I think a lot of material that's been developed for teachers to teach young people is very prescribed movement. Um, it's very... Uh, tick the boxes of movement. And I think it's a little bit uninspiring, a little bit dry, and that's that's nobody's fault. I just think that's the way it is. Um, but one thing that I'm bringing into next week's session is a creative toolbox, because you know what you said there about maybe he's not having the confidence or not having the skills. This is something that I hear all the time when I work with teachers. They say like, oh, how did you turn that into a dance? And yeah, it's fair enough. I, I know how to do that because I've trained how to do it. But actually there's a, a sort of like a, I've developed like this five step system that most professional choreographers that I know kind of use. And I want to share it with you next week. And it's basically just how we can look at anything, even like a cup and see the world as movement rather than what it is. And hopefully that inspires you or gives you some sort of uh, nutrition if you're developing your own movements uh, classes later on. Yeah, brilliant. As I say, we use, we, we've got the Val Sabin um, dance files, um, but we're wanting to really move away from that because I think lots of the staff do find it difficult to, to teach from that perspective and very prescriptive. So 
again, it'll be lovely next week to have those ideas that I can share. So thank you. Great. Thank you very much. That may be everybody. Oh, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, well uh, oh, oh, sorry. No, as all I was going to say is, all I was going to say is, thank you, thank you very much for having me. I hope it's been beneficial. I've had, I've had a pleasure putting it all together. Um, and next week's session, like I said, is going to be a lot more practical. So come ready to move. You don't need to have a massive space. I'm going to be teaching. I'm going to purposely put myself in the kitchen next week to show you what it looks like from a small space, so that it can be done anywhere. And you know, make sure you just clear the space of any of any debris and things like that. Uh, debris <laughs> any objects but also just uh if, if you're aware the first sort of 30 minutes is going to be on the how i structure a lesson uh, how i put things together so hopefully you can you can take that away and then we'll spend like 45 minutes doing some movement and we'll leave the last 15 minutes to sort of if you want to ask any questions or why i would choose that or how i would do that in that situation with with this age range we can go into all of that Sounds brilliant. Well, on behalf of Culture Bridge, I just want to say a massive thank you to Rob and for everybody for joining in so well today. It's been really interesting.